Dear friends, uh, welcome uh, to Materium's uh, second event at COP26, where we will be discussing the three futures of climate action, uh, whether it is politics, diplomacy, or technology. Now, of course, uh, COP26, uh, 26th Conference of the Parties, uh, is an example of uh, global diplomacy all coming together on this occasion in the city of Glasgow uh, to uh, plan, to iterate, to discuss how the world can tackle the climate crisis. Uh, we have seen uh, political action on the streets. We have seen protesters, we have seen performers, uh, we have seen uh, uh, people trying to uh, send their message via political action um, and of course we are seeing political action both in national parliaments and in city council chambers um, and uh, we are also seeing uh, technology companies some of them startups with uh, innovative ideas of how they can make things better uh, some technology companies being uh, almost as powerful as some nation states the question is uh, can these three dimensions come together and work together to make things better? Or is, the, is their path so diverse that this cannot happen? Uh, we have an amazing panel here today. Uh, we will, I think we will introduce the folks as, we, uh, as, as they speak. Uh, uh, but uh, first, uh, we're going to hear remotely from uh, Professor Michael Manelli uh, of Zien, uh, the financial science uh, think tank. Uh, he is also an older man uh, in the city of London and the sheriff of the city of London, a uh, hugely knowledgeable and experienced individual, and we are very lucky to have this, uh, this message from him. Good evening. I am Michael Manelli. And it is a delight to have been invited by Vinay Gupta and the team at Materium to address you today up in Glasgow at COP26. The title I've been given is Real Finance Beyond ESG, Beyond Environmental, Social, or Governance. And I've deliberately chosen this World War I advertisement on the right, Daddy, What Did You Do in the Great War? to emphasize that all of us, I feel, are trying to figure out our place in the Great climate change war. But I also hope that today you'll understand why I'm not a COP26. I believe that there are better things to do than to interview with the people trying to get their job done up there. However, we here in London run a think tank called Zien, and we have many ideas on what we feel could help enormously. I'm going to talk about two. One, which many people talk about, a carbon tax or carbon price. And the second, government policy performance bonds. I'll come on to both of those, but they are based on a lot of research that we do here, in particular from our three indices, the Global Financial Centers Index, the Global Green Finance Index, and the Smart Centers Index. What I'd like to cover in the short time available is my thoughts on green so far, 
the various viewpoints and frames that we use, the roadmaps that will get us to net zero carbon in 2050, and what might FinTech do in these climate wars. The first thing, of course, to emphasize is that the city or the financial sector has actually taken climate change quite seriously for far longer than most people know. The very first Clean Air Act was in 1953 in the city of London, well before the National Clean Air Act. And we had a number of initiatives ranging from the London Accord, which was commissioned before the Stern Review, including support as well for the Stern Review, our various indices, and currently the Green Finance Institute. I had my first debate on climate change in 1984 here in the city of London, and that debate would end today where it ended then. Does society really want to pay for it? And can we talk honestly about the numbers involved? So what we're focusing on here as a theme is that policies need pricing. And this slide, the top half of this slide, actually comes from 2007. Focus on the carbon market, set higher policy standards, avoid carbon dumping wars, and support more research, because some of these areas are not as well researched as people might have you believe. But on the bottom of this slide, I've said, listen to the music of COP26, or should I say the financial music, the Stern Review concluded that 1% to 2% of GDP was required. So too did the London Accord. And this translates today into approximately US $400 to $800 per UK citizen. Another way of looking at it is to take the just slightly under 10 tons emitted on average by each British citizen and multiply it by the current price of carbon, which is approximately $50, and you come to US $500 per year per capita, or multiply it by a target which is likely to come about if the carbon markets are extended from approximately 40% to 100% of something circa $100, in other words, $1,000 per year. And these are not the numbers that you hear. And until you hear realistic numbers, I think it's difficult to talk about climate change in the round. Not least because awareness isn't going to be sufficient. We had an enormous shutdown and change of behavior in developing countries around the world last year due to the pandemic and found in fact that emissions only dropped by 6% at, uh, at a small point. So we need to look to, to what are finance people thinking? Well, they are thinking pricing and that's very, very important in terms of carbon pricing. But the second thing that's bothering them is in fact the political and regulatory frameworks, which they don't trust. An argument here in the city has been if you wanted to be a successful investor, you probably got that way by betting against government policies on green, which often are capricious and change and cost those who follow the government uh, quite significantly when they are altered unseemingly or due to political interests. Another area that's not particularly strong on what I might call deep practitioners' minds is ESG, environmental, social, and governance. This idea has been that investment can be redirected well, it's had 25 years and more already. It's still, as MIT calls it, an aggregate confusion project with uh, companies such as Shell in the top 5% on one ESG algorithm and the bottom on another. There's an alphabet soup of these models and we're creating effectively a separate currency as well as, I might point out, driving a number of brown firms into private equity. And what we are seeing in gross aggregate is in fact that firms around the world, finance firms and industrial firms are still betting in ranges of approximately eight to one that fossil fuels will be around for some time. In other words, they don't believe in government policies. But we do need a roadmap to conclusion and you're probably very familiar with some of these technology roadmaps which look at where our emissions can work their way down to zero. And these are of course, absolutely crucial, but they need to be supported in turn by roadmaps that are related to finance. So we happen to be big supporters of the Sustainable Development Goals, but there are other roadmaps out there. Uh, this one on the left from Project Drawdown actually talks, and I think this is interesting, where the sixth top solution to climate change is actually educating girls. So we're going to see a multiplicity of ways to achieve our targets, and that's what markets are very good at. Trillions of decisions within, over, within an overall price framework with some competition can see enormous amounts of change in a way that awareness or behavior change can't. 
And so we need to move from the bottom two quadrants, regulation and ESG, and there's nothing wrong with either of those, and they need to be maintained perhaps, but we also need to charge, and that can be via taxation or via internalized costs. And frankly, auctioned permits uh, that are tradable are tantamount to a tax if, in fact, people are paying for them up front. So I, I would argue we need economics. Plandemics are insufficient. And when we look at these things of where, where are pandemics happening, it's really about trying to add to a lot of this top-down talk, the bottom-up mechanism of hard financial decisions made day to day. And to put those financial decisions into a much stronger framework, one of the things that was proposed both at COP in Copenhagen and at COP in Paris was the idea of government policy performance bonds. We've seen performance bonds emerging in the private sector since 2018, and a government equivalent would basically be that a government issues a bond that pays an interest rate that rises if it fails to meet its target. With the proliferation of 2050 net zero carbon targets, for example, a government might issue a bond of say 10 billion, and if in 2025 it hasn't decreased its emissions by 14%, which is exactly what the straight line projection is at 3.57% reduction a year, then the bond would pay the difference. So if it hasn't gone down by 14%, but it has gone down by 10, the bond would pay 4%. If it hasn't gone down by 14%, but it's gone down by five, then the bond would pay 9%. If it's actually gone down by 14% or more, the government effectively gets a free loan. And those people who felt that they didn't trust government policy had been able to hedge it appropriately and ensure convergence here between the private and the public sectors. Governments want us investors and private sector entrepreneurs to invest 25 to 30 years ahead. Well, it too needs to put some financial skin in the game or it is being hypocritical. So I would argue governments need these policy bond cuffs. They are known in the private sector as ESG link, sustainability linked, performance incentive. And you can see here at the bottom, a huge number of firms have issued these uh, just in the last few years. And it may constitute something like a third of the green bond market by value. So I think we're here talking here about recognition of the obvious. Carbon pricing matters. If we get different people to make different decisions every single day, the world would be a better place. And these better economic decisions need to include externality. In fact, carbon is no different than any other pollutant one should charge for its use and its emission. Might point out price really does matter. Um, the example I love to use is that in 2013, US drivers drove 4% fewer miles per capita. And it wasn't because they'd finally got the message of the Sierra Club. It was because petrol prices rose by 32% that year. And these trillions of financial decisions will turn up in the systems that all of us love building in the fintech world. A good example was how DeepMind, using its machine learning and AI, reduced Google's data center cooling bill by 40%. And that was, frankly, millions and millions of little tiny decisions at every point along the way. And so this is where fintech really does have a strong role to play in the climate wars. There are big opportunities out there for AI and machine learning, dynamic anomaly and pattern recognition and finance in areas like the carbon markets, energy storage markets, transport markets, really combining economy efficiency, effectiveness and innovation with reductions in time, eliminating some of the problems to do with different locations, combining functions and reducing consumption. So we can save the planet one bit at a time, but market measures are essential, not desirable. It is not about awareness. We need competition, open data, better regulation, and voluntary standards markets, of course, a well-rounded market, and fintech should be lobbying both for cost of carbon, but also for policy performance bonds to ensure that there really are financial handcuffs on government policy as well. And the implication for me and for fintech should be a shift from the idea that we're labeling saving products as green or transactions as green, but we're really moving to a much stronger focus on trading and the Internet of Things markets, moving from putting 
little lipstick type applications on the pigs of banks to creating mini Echo Bloombergs for the masses so that all of us have got the tools and the power to make those trillions of decisions much better. So I would conclude by saying thank you very much to the team at Materium for allowing me to share some of my thoughts with you today. I hope that you're enjoying COP. I hope that you are thinking hard about how it works, but when you return home, do remember that markets are going to be the way that we will solve climate change and that we need as people in finance to work extremely hard at convincing government that it too needs to put some skin in the game financially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Manelli. Uh, that was uh, fascinating, informative, and uh, what, a, what a strong proposal. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce now friend, uh, colleague, uh, mentor, uh, thought leader, author, uh, CEO and founder of Materium, uh, Vinay Gupta, uh, who has, uh, he, will, he will tell you about his background in uh, planning for uh, uh, emergency situations and uh, working for many years, decades to address uh, climate change. Uh, he is, uh, uh, He's, uh, he's here today to talk about uh, how the blockchain can, uh, can enable a net zero economy. Okie dokie. <clears throat> um, so, uh, is that a little high? Is that about right? It doesn't matter. It's fine. It's fine. So, um, Get my clicker here. I guess the first thing I mention is uh, we have just announced a partnership with Xi'an um, to produce a set of services which will give people uh, easy access to the uh, emissions trading standards, uh, emissions trading markets, both the EU standard and the UK standard. Um, so over the next few months, we're actually going to stand up some technology. So when you have something to offset, you can call a set of APIs to basically buy carbon directly from the UK and the EU markets at your preference and actually retire those carbon credits then and there. Um, so there are systems like that which are in play for different kinds of tokenized carbon products which you see being produced by a lot of folks in the blockchain market. This is going to provide the same sort of ease of use, but it will be going directly to the main international and national carbon markets. Uh, and the details of that are on the Zen blog, and I've just tweeted them out from the Materium account from my account. So we're doing something concrete. It's a nice little step. Uh, and I think that will get integrated into a lot of products over the next year or two. Um, great, right, that was a last minute thing. Now we've got to get into this. <sighs> right, so um, this is gonna be a long trek, right? Um, because what I'm gonna try and describe is a fundamentally new way the world can work, right? The world as it currently stands, there are a set of things that are just the way they are. And that includes like how we think about our relationship with physical goods. Um, does anybody remember the sort of transformation that occurred when we started to get digital mapping in cars and then on phones? Right? You get that. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, right? There'd be like somebody would invite you to a party in like some weird corridor of London and you would carry a physical A to Z and you'd be guessing about bus routes to get there. And consequently, you tended only to go to places that you knew because getting anywhere else was difficult. Then came the maps, then came Uber. And now at this point, you know, as long as you know roughly how far away someplace is, generally speaking, you never wonder about where it is. The robots know that for you. So what I'm going to be talking about is a transformation like that and at that kind of scale for our relationship with physical goods, right? You know, the microphone clicker, the shoe, the bicycle, the car, the house really, really deep into the fabric, what happens when you start using computers to assist our ability to own and use physical matter as a category? Um, so, Materium itself uh, comes out of me basically being a disaster relief guy. Uh, I kind of got religion on this in 2002, uh, and I cooked up a 30-year plan for handling hundreds of millions of climate refugees. 
I'm not going to talk about that planning work. I'm not going to talk about the various technologies that I've shipped towards that goal. But Materium is one of a series of things that are pointed towards this goal because Materium's structure is useful both for cutting carbon emissions in the economy as it stands, but also critically for running very, very tight supply networks for managing hundreds of millions of climate refugees. It starts as a developed world economy tool for reducing carbon uh, and increasing you know, your reuse of goods, but then it can also have disaster relief applications on the same technology base or very similar one. Uh, and my background is basically, from after 9-11, I, I got very heavily involved in defense, security, and resilience. Then 2014, I left to join the Ethereum team, project managed the launch of Ethereum. Then shortly after that, started Materium, and here we are. That's a fair summary. I should also mention the book, which you have in front of you, uh, called The Future of Stuff, written during the pandemic. And it directly addresses a lot of the topics we're going to be talking about today in terms of transparency about our physical goods. All right, so um, let me name check here Bruce Sterling's Shaping Things. Uh, that's a very important book to the Materium work. Uh, Bruce is one of our colleagues now. That is another thing which is massively worth reading. Uh, right, let's get into this. Um, so circular economy basically comes in multiple scopes. This doesn't exactly fit the scope one, scope two, scope three carbon emissions, but it's pretty close. The majority of thinking on circular economy is scope three circular economy. You take your plastic object, you throw it into the trash, it is taken away to a recycling center, they melt it down, then they turn it into another piece of plastic which you buy in a shop and you take home and you use it and you throw it in the trash. So the goods are going all the way back out into the remanufacturing process and they're coming all the way back in again. And that long loop means you're paying to manufacture them again and you're paying to distribute them again and you're paying to haul the stuff out there in the first place. So that loop has a lot of friction on it. And one of the reasons that circular economy has gotten off to a kind of slow start, even though the idea is perfect, is because there is specifically so much friction on that circular loop. So what we're talking about here is a very low friction version of the circular loop where rather than the goods going all the way around into remanufacturing and back out again, you simply take the laptop that you have replaced to your neighbor next door who buys it off you. You take the bicycle that you've decided you've had enough of riding because you know it's just it's cold and wet out there and it's winter and you don't really want to bike in that and you simply sell that bicycle to somebody uh, younger and fitter who decides they are going to bike this winter and you just pass it on to them so that kind of circularity rather than the goods going into the trash and being torn to pieces the goods are simply handed to somebody that wants them and in a world with eight billion people you know a billion of whom live in absolute poverty there is always somebody that wants the stuff, right? We're not short of mouths, we're not short of feet. Why is it that we can't just take the things which are useful and pass them on and pass them on and pass them on and pass them on? A lot of the answer to that is we can't figure out who wants them. So has anybody seen these videos of the places in Africa where the container loads of used clothes wind up after they've fallen out the back end of the charity shops? And about half of it is just winding up in these enormous, gigantic hills of clothing. That's not happening because nobody wants to wear those clothes. It's happening because the people in that specific city don't want to wear those clothes. Right? You put those clothes in the places where people do want them, they won't go. They will be used. Very little in this world is so broken that nobody wants it, given how much poverty there is. So to be able to get this kind of circularity in place, what we have is a routing problem. I have a thing, I no longer want it. Could you figure out who wants or needs this most? And could you sell it to them? Or could you give it to them? And for this, we need an ontology of things, and we need an ontology of needs, and we need some way of matching. So this is all basically a data problem. And if you solve the data problem, as digital mapping did for navigation, um, Materium will do for ownership. It changes the relationship between people and things. Right, uh, here we go. So, the platform. Um, I think we have adequately covered the amount of rubbish in the world. It's a lot. Um, so, critical concept. <clears throat> in this vision of the world, nothing is ever made to be thrown away. Right? And this is just absolutely the critical concept when you buy something, the intention that you have is that you will resell it. 
right? You might be reselling it to somebody that will then melt it down and recycle it and reuse it and it will be used as a raw material. But for the vast majority of the stuff in this story, what's going to happen is you will buy the thing with an explicit plan for selling it again when you're done with it. I buy the bicycle in spring, I anticipate selling the bicycle again in autumn, I accept that the bicycle is worth a little more in spring than it is in autumn, but at the end of the day, that's the cheapest way for me to own a bike, and in the, spring, uh, the next spring, I will buy another bike. So this model of everything you buy, you intend to sell again, this would apply to furniture, clothes, consumer electronics, transport vehicles. And the vast majority of the stuff that you actually personally own is in one of those four categories. Right. That's just about all of our stuff. Every single one of those things has dramatically inefficient, ineffective resale markets right now. The resale markets are terrible. Does anybody ever sell anything on eBay? Right? Is it not really time-consuming and annoying? So that right there, the time-consuming and annoying nature of selling things, leaves us with a kind of difficult quandary because we wind up with huge piles of stuff that we don't want but it's too much trouble to sell it. It feels morally wrong to throw it in the trash. You feel like you're losing too much money if you give it to a charity shop, and so you wind up just leaving it, filling up a closet or an attic or the back of a car. And that problem is happening because capitalism has made it incredibly liquid and easy to buy things, but it's made it really, really quite difficult for individual consumers to sell them again. And there are a number of obstacles on that path to being able to sell again. As a result, when other people want to buy the thing that you have, you're probably not putting it on the market right now. And as a result, they tend to buy a new one. And now there are two. There's the one clogging up your attic, and there is the one clogging up their attic. And now we have two problems. Right? So getting rid of this right, asymmetry between buying and selling for individuals, this is kind of a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized vision. Rather than you buying the vast majority of your things from stores, the idea is that you will buy new things when you need a new thing, but the rest of the time you're going to buy things second-hand and you're going to buy things that are fully embedded in this model of circularity. And that is a tech problem. You sort out the technology, sort out the marketplaces, sort out the logistics, and it's entirely possible to create a world in which things are bought and sold and moved around just as easily from consumers to other consumers as from Amazon to other consumers. It's a circulatory com economy rooted in decentralized commerce. Um, so, <clears throat> places where this is already done. International commodities markets. This is your you know, futures for steel or you know, uh, food, corn, all these you know, massive things where one ton of corn is much the same as another ton of, ton of corn, and they have very carefully defined specifications which give you a sense of you know, how these two sets of wheat differ. You know, this wheat is a little damper than that wheat. It's gone from 1.4% you know, humidity to 23 That means you have to use it a little sooner. There are these kind of fine variations that are well documented, but the commodities markets, they run incredibly efficiently. If you have something to sell that fits into the commodities framework, you have no problem with identifying buyers for it. It just works. Um, on the other hand, we've got the goods which we are dealing with day to day, the things that we own, and they are not at all like that, right? The biggest single economic drag is the thing we call the doubt discount. So you have a thing, you want to sell it, the person who buys it doesn't believe you when you say this thing is in great new condition. They're kind of like, maybe it is, maybe you're lying. They lowball the offer to you. You think the thing is worth $1,000, they think it's worth $1,000, they think there's a 20% chance it's broken and you're not telling them, they offer you 800 and then you think, I'm not going to sell this for 800 I know it's worth 1000 bucks, and I know that it's not broken. And that asymmetry in information between the buyer and the seller causes the prices to get pushed apart from each other. So the seller has very good information and says it's worth $1,000, I'm not going to take a penny less. The buyer is like, uh, maybe 800, maybe 1,000, maybe 100, maybe 1,000. I don't really trust this. They depress the price, and the result is that the trade doesn't happen, and the seller is stuck with the liquid stuff clogging up their closets again. Right, this, is the, this is the hard path. So if we get equal information between the buyers and the sellers, it takes away the expectation that they're going to pay two different prices for the same object. Right? And at that point, you can have a deal. Right? I think it's worth $1,000. 
you've got excellent third-party reviews that tell you this object is in great new condition, it's definitely worth $1,000, you pay $1,000 for it, it leaves my basement. Problem solved. And all the you know, CO2 and other uh, environmental damage that would have been done by making another one, we got rid of all of that. One more, come on. So this question about resolving value uncertainty, right? although it seems like a kind of weird, boring, technical, mechanical question, the actual fact of it is that the reason that we don't have a circular economy is value uncertainty. The reason that eBay and the charity shops and second-hand dealers and antique dealers and used car dealers and all the rest of that, the reason that that system has not solved consumer capitalism is because nobody can figure out the condition of the goods or what anything is worth. And that's literally the thing that is causing us to have these gigantic avoidable environmental footprints. It's, it's amazing when you bring it down to this level of simplicity, but it is literally this problem of, I don't want this anymore, would anybody like it? And if we could efficiently solve that so I wasn't losing so much value every time I sell the second-hand thing, all of these problems dramatically reduce. Um, so, C to C e-commerce, right? Literally, this is the question of how do we buy and sell things from each other, right? The existing infrastructure for this is dramatically less efficient than the infrastructure for buying new stuff. We've already discussed that a little bit. Um, the table stakes for solving that problem are enormous. And uh, now let me skip forward a little. So. How do we solve this? Um, let us suppose that I want to sell this clicker to Anton, right? You know, I wound up with this thing because I accidentally took it home after a talk, and now it's sitting in my basement because I have no idea where it actually came from. Anton wants a clicker, but he's got to figure out whether this clicker works with his AV setup. So question one, does this clicker work with his AV setup? Well, I don't know anything about clickers, other than, you know, came home with me by accident. He doesn't know anything about clickers. We're just people that want to do, like, talks and have performances and, you know, do things with slide decks. So somebody that knows about clickers is somebody from an AV department at, say, university or high school. That person sits at home, takes, I send them a picture of the clicker and say, hey, will this work with his setup? They say yes or they say no. If they say yes, they write a warranty. If you pay me 50 cents, a dollar, then if you send him the clicker and it doesn't work with his setup, I will pay you $12.50, which is the cost of replacing the clicker. Now that warranty, it's not just a warranty on the clicker, it's a warranty about the context in which the clicker has value. I know that this thing is valuable to him because it solves his problem, even though it is not valuable to me. So, and this is the critical part, we are generating wealth by attaching information to objects, right? Now, I'm gonna take that very slowly because it is a weird concept, right? In my care, this thing is useless because I don't have the equipment that it plugs into. I can't just send it to him because he doesn't know if it works and he's not gonna buy it. I need somebody to add information to this before the thing has value, and that person has specialized knowledge about clickers. So they take the clicker, they verify it will work with his setup. Immediately, this has gone from being worthless junk to being worth $12.50. And at that point, I sell it to Anton. And Anton takes it. Have a clicker, right? Now, at that point, he doesn't have to buy a new clicker, which involves mining oil to make plastic to cast into a thing and all the electronics and so on. I have rid of this thing, which was cluttering my house. And the kid in the high school AV department that gave me the expert opinion that the clicker will work with Anton's rig has just made 50 cents for a piece of knowledge that was right on the top of their head. So what we have here is an alchemical process. We take knowledge, which is currently not being used to generate value. We take goods, which are currently costing people money to store. And we take unmet human need, and we alchemically combine these things. I am benefited, I got rid of the clicker and I made some money. The kid with the knowledge about the AV stuff is benefited, they made some money for having expertise. And Anton is benefited because he didn't have to pay carbon and other taxes for generating a clicker that actually he could have had a used one and it would have been just fine. Right? And that mechanism we call a trust community. You have multiple parties, a buyer, a seller, and a set of independent experts 
What binds the trust community together is knowledge about an object and financial interest in an object, and the financial interest is represented as warranties and insurance. So the buyer, Anton's position, buys the clicker, but they also buy the warranties associated with the clicker, and that's how we bind knowledge to matter to reverse entropy. So rather than having this you know, extraordinarily chaotic vortex behind the consumer economy, where all of the stuff in the world is piled up in this enormous kind of junk pile in basements and in thrift stores and on eBay, rather than having this kind of entropic destruction of value because we throw away the knowledge about things and then the stuff is left as brute physical matter with no intelligence, what we're doing is we're maintaining and upgrading the intelligence that we have about physical objects in a way that dramatically increases your utility and value. And this is literally money from thin air. It's wealth from thin air, because by rebinding an object to its story, we take it from the status as trash in the bottom of some bucket back into the position of being a product. It is an elevation of physical matter. Uh, and it's done by arranging humans and knowledge and money in a way that, as the slide says, enables the object to go where it's most valued. Now, you know, let's think about the categories here. We have clothes, we have furniture, we have transportation vehicles, and we have consumer electronics. Practically every single thing in this room, other than the plants, is in one of those categories. So if we can do this for those four categories, we can generate a circular economy where it becomes possible to do things like match chairs. You have three of a four chair set because the last chair got lost when you moved house. You'd like the fourth chair. Oh, well, I took a picture of it. It got scanned. Somebody checked it against the database. We identified other chairs which will match. Somebody will sell you one of those chairs. It's only 75 miles from where you live, and a truck is going between those two locations in three days. Do you want the chair? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. And everybody in that deal was benefited because what use is one chair of a matching set? Well, it's way more valuable to me, because I have the other three chairs, than it is to the poor person whose house it's cluttering. And that mechanism is basically reordering all of the physical matter in the world to generate value by putting the objects in the hands of the people that want them most. Oh, there we are, right? The Materium Knowledge Graph reverses entropy. Right. It's a really, really simple idea. And if you carry it out competently and you get the details right, the world changes as much as it changed when we got digital mapping. So <clears throat> there are an enormous number of benefits from fixing a fundamental process like selling the things that you no longer need. Right? The benefits are universal because the process of consumption is universal. This stuff is metabolic. It's core to what makes human beings human beings, making things and exchanging things. Uh, I'm just going to pick up a couple of things. Durable goods. So if we have goods which are going around this circular economy again and again and again, you're going to tend to buy things which are more durable because if you buy everything with the intention of one day selling it, you will get a much better price if the thing is in good condition when you sell it. So you buy quality that will last, and when you sell it, you sell it for a higher value than if you'd bought junk. Um, I don't know how old these jeans are. I don't know how many people had them before I did. Denim, vintage denim on eBay seems to have peaked about 25, 30 years ago and the denim made in that era never ages. It's amazing, right? I, I have no idea how old this watch is. I don't know where it came from. I bought it from a friend who was a watch collector in London. Uh, I've worn it, could have had 10 owners, could have had one. Probably it will work for another 50 or 100 years. Probably won't even need maintenance, right? It just turns out that good stuff lasts forever, and if you don't need it to be particularly shiny, you know, I mean, life is good, right? You know, do we really care whether these kind of objects, you know, these chairs you're sitting on, do you care if that's the first time somebody has sat in them? Right? There are very few things that we're really particular about, right? A very few things we really care about, you know, like you're going to want new socks, we understand that. But for everything else, particularly for fun things, you know, you want to go skiing, right, or you want to take up roller skating, do you need new roller skates? No, I just need really good quality old roller skates and I'm going to try it for three months and if I don't like it, I'm going to pass them on. You know, 151 people have tried these roller skates and they've been running perfectly successfully since the 1980s. Now, this raises some other questions. 
Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over some of the technical slides here and get a little more into the why questions. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. So, um, the critical thing about this is what about innovation, right? If we're going to have people continue to generate amazing new things, we need to find a mechanism which allows people to continue to innovate while we're in this kind of circular economy paradigm. And the way that that works is at the very top end, you have pros, right? Sometimes you call these folks uh, prosumers, that's another category, but you have the people who by definition want the best available thing, right? You're a professional photographer, you want the best available camera, because if you don't have the best available camera, the shots that you take will look like you didn't have the best gear and that will make you look like you're an amateur. So at the top end of these circular marketplaces, you have the entry point of the new goods. And the entry point of the new goods is for the people that are going to extremes. They are the professional photographers. They are the mountain climbers. They are the cross-country skiers. They are the bicycle racers. They are the people that need to have the best stuff because they are extraordinarily driven by function and they're pushing the equipment to its very limit. They need the greatest, not because they are greedy, they need the greatest because they're pushing right to the limit of human performance, and at that point, the equipment enables them to reach further. And if you think about brands like North Face, North Face sell to the pros, at least that's their advertising. The vast majority of what they make is outdated technology, five-year-old machines that produce Gore-Tex, which was really great five years ago and now is a little behind the curve. They have a pro market where they sell stuff for $400, and a top-end North Face jacket has cost $400 forever because this is the price the pros will pay for the best available gear, and their tolerance to put that money on the table hasn't changed much over time. North Face charges it because they can. So that approach continues to run unchanged. The difference is that rather than having a whole bunch of machinery that is producing sort of long out of date Gore-Tex stuff that really nobody is gonna use if they have an alternative, but it's being sold for cheap, all of that stuff becomes filled with the gear which was pro gear five years ago. So you sell way more of the pro gear to the pros because they know that they'll pay $400 for the jacket now, they will sell it for $375 in a year, and they will buy next year's pro jacket. So what we're doing is we're cutting the price for the pros to acquire the very latest and greatest gear, but in return for that, far more of the pros will upgrade every single year and get every single upgrade. So the projection here is an economy where pretty much the entire pro category for whatever it is, musical instruments, posh cars, you know, catwalk fashion, whatever it happens to be, the pros will all upgrade every year and they will start to make a living by having excellent taste. They buy the new stuff, they sell it on in a year. If they bought something which everybody thinks is amazing, they'll get a slightly higher price. If they brought something which is considered to be a failed experiment, they'll get a slightly lower price. But they will continue to be able to subsidize their purchase of the best available stuff effectively because the second-hand markets will take up the slack. So if I'm North Face or Apple or Canon or Nikon or any one of these brands, if I'm you know, uh, uh, Porsche or BMW or Fiat or whoever it is, what happens is that every year I sell a lot more of the high-end product and I service a lot more of the parts and maintenance and spares for the things which I made 10 years ago which are now in continuous use because we figured out how our second-hand markets really work. So the suggestion here is that the innovation engine not only continues to run, but it runs faster and harder. And what we get rid of is the manufacturing of things which are kind of substandard because technology has moved on and kind of nobody's coming in to fill in the gaps. Right? It's a differently structured market, but it is not a kind of circular economy which kills innovation, and it's not a kind of circular economy that kills mass production. Instead, rather than these amazing goods that we're making only really existing for a small rich elite that is constantly under financial pressure to upgrade, instead what we're doing is we are spreading the wealth tier by tier by tier by tier because if the goods are durable and they age well, 15-year-old digital cameras that run on AA batteries are being played with as toys by kids in Mexican towns. 
right? Hey, it's your fifth birthday. Have a digital camera. It costs $2.50. It's really, really fun. And you're five years old, and maybe it will get broken, and maybe I can fix it, and maybe I can't, right? Hey, now I'm a five-year-old with a digital camera. I am happy. I don't care if it's 15 years old, right? Kind of looks like a phone, takes pictures. I can't call anybody. You know, like, this is made of wind, right? And when you're a kid, do you care? You know, I don't know how much Lego I had when I was a kid, but there was a lot of it. I guarantee a lot of it did not arrive in my house new. I never noticed, right? And that question, right, do we need the new thing or do we just need the thing? Imagine clothing if it came in enormous fleet libraries in cities, right? There are 13,800 pieces of clothing in your size available today. Tomorrow, it will be a different selection because some things will have been sold into the pool and some things will have been bought out of the pool. A constantly shifting panoply of things which fit you perfectly because we've got digital sizing and you can wear them anytime you like. And that as a model, right? More consumer choice, lower environmental footprint. And you know, when was the last time you heard about a thing which was going to increase your quality of life and also dramatically cut your environmental footprint? It's not a common model. I got very excited when we figured this out, let me tell you. Uh, it made my little energy policy heart jump. So then we get to the house, right? Now we're gonna do the gory technical bit. Yeah, we're okay for time. So um, using the blockchain the right way, right? We took this week, last week, the Avalanche blockchain, which is probably the fifth largest blockchain in the world, we took it to net zero. Uh, we talked to them about it. We told them that we needed it to do our circular economy thing. We couldn't do the circular economy thing on a blockchain that wasn't net zero. And we basically were like, please, please. And they said, OK, fine. It's COP26. Have your Christmas present early. We are now net zero. And they did it. They bought the carbon offsets, and boom, they're now net zero. So that gives us a blockchain. And the reason you want a blockchain for this is you want the data about the goods to last longer than the goods do, right? You want the data to be as permanent as possible because the data is what gives the goods value in the second-hand market. No data, no second-hand sale, thing becomes landfill, you take the environmental impact, everyone is miserable. You have to keep the data alive. So if I have 300 bicycles made from some little bicycle startup, which then folds out in year three, they made great bikes. They couldn't make a living doing it. The bikes are now second hand. All the engineering data about the bikes is perfectly alive on the blockchain, even though the original manufacturer is gone. That's why we use a blockchain, one of the several reasons. So publication of what something is, durable record keeping. Uh, change of ownership, right? If we have kind of digital tags on these objects and we have a partnership with a very nice digital tag company, then when the objects change hands, we always know who the owner is and that really helps figure out whose property is who if you're turning these over at a very, very accelerated rate. Uh, guaranteed payments. So again, all of these systems where you have a third party in the trust community who is adding value to the object by telling you about it and giving you its attributes, they have to be paid and they have to be guaranteeably paid because the legal warranty that they're selling is not going to kick into place until the payment has gone to them and it's guaranteed. So because we've got these very, very hard records of ownership, that allows us to make sure that we've constant legal coverage for the information about the objects. It protects us from errors where somebody has a credit card charge back happened because they made a payment it didn't work, then they lost their warranty on the deal, then the goods went through the process and they bought something that they had no insurance on. Permanent payments, really important. Uh, finally, dispute resolution. All of the facts about all of these transactions are stored on chain and the result of that is that the, the system is constantly prepared for litigation. You do a transaction, something goes wrong, you make the claim of the warranty, if there is a dispute with the person offering the warranty, you can immediately go in and figure that out. It's a very, very powerful mechanism. Um, there we are. So final part, how do we get involved, right? The platform is live today. So we built the first version of the platform for handling appreciating assets, um, uh, antiquities, fine art, um, collectibles, uh, gold bullion, we're doing gold bullion, it's a weird story, but we're doing carbon offsets for the mining of the gold. So you buy the gold as an NFT, it comes with the carbon offsets, very clean system. Um, so it's up and running right now, it uses the OpenSea system, which is the 
absolutely standard way of buying and selling NFTs. We also just took it onto a platform called Polygon, previously called Matic. So we're now able to issue these things on an L2 solution which has low transaction costs, low carbon emissions. Um, the version which is running on Avalanche, I think is probably three months out, might be less. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a long story. So, um, the asset password itself is a series of legal warranties committed by different people. So that's the trust community structure. It's called an asset password. Each page of the asset password has a different set of information guaranteed by a different party. Um, I just mentioned the gold with the carbon offset, so we covered that. Um, and basically, right, you know, what happens if you run this kind of circular economy is that the take-make-waste economy begins to look like the oil or the coal economy. It's just another outmoded artifact of fossil-fueled capitalism where we run the economy basically straight from the oil well or the coal mine right into the garbage. And in that context, you don't really want something like Amazon, which is a one-way economy that basically is just accelerated take-make-waste. What you want is a system in which there is a genuine ability to get the goods around this circular economy. Uh, and that is, I think, it. Boom. No, I'm just going to skip these. Oh, yeah, we talked about the book. Um, so that's it. There you are. Right? That's how the world could work. Okay. And th the reason that we're doing it this way is that I spent 20 years banging my head against policy when I was working in energy policy think tanks and defense security and resilience contexts. And I just could not find any way of getting government to change its... I don't know. Ten years ago, you know, I was a mask activist. We had H5N1, it was the flu pandemic, it was extremely scary, and I spent a lot of time banging my head on government's doors saying, could we not get things like a national reserve for masks done? I had a site called Flu Code, which was all about like wear masks. Masks are super important. Ten years later, the pandemic arrives. The masks that you're wearing are the masks which are really, really, really well scientifically tested to prevent airborne infection spreading. They have really good data to back them up. Right? The cloth masks that we get used to wearing during the pandemic, not such great data, really not so effective. Right? So this notion that, you know, like, market activism works. If you want to solve the problem, you can do it commercially, but you have to turn up and you have to get involved and you have to raise capital and deploy capital and you have to build systems. You know, I'm trying that because I kind of lost faith in the other approach. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to our discussions because, you know, like, you know, I have opinions. And on that note, I will stop. Thank you, Vinay. Okay, uh, our next panelist is uh, one of my oldest friends. I'm very happy that uh, he's joined us here today. Um, I've known him for, I think, about 25 years, which is a terrifying thought. Uh, and uh, Katie was uh, saying to me earlier, our team member Katie, that this is the ultimate version of, of a circular economy, how this, sort of our relationship and our friendship has come full circle. Uh, James Golding is a technical director at Epic Games, which is a very large technology company. And uh, whilst uh, Materium is a startup, uh, the company that James works for is, is very big. Uh, and uh, James, uh, even though he represents one particular segment uh, of the technology industry, I think he's going to share some thoughts with us about how tech can uh, drive uh, climate action. Thank you very much, Anton. Um, so just a, a few thoughts today around technology. And obviously, technology is a huge, broad topic. Uh, I'm not someone who knows about inventing new kinds of concrete and steel or capturing carbon. But what we do at Epic is build virtual worlds, um, build real-time 3D worlds based on data, based on all kinds of things, based on creativity. And we feel, and certainly I feel, that there's lots of opportunity there to to couple that with climate change, which is obviously a very real world problem. But like Vinay was talking about, there's amazing things you can do when you couple the real world and the digital world. And you can just look at recent headlines uh, around you know, some US companies and what they're thinking around the metaverse. And that's the last time I'll use that word uh, today. Um, but it certainly shows that there's a lot of interest in, in this real time 3D world. 
So I think in terms of technology and, and politics and diplomacy, uh, it's not a topic, you know, politics is not something that a lot of tech companies spend a lot of time necessarily thinking about. But it's very interesting, you know, Bill Gates' book that came out earlier in the year, he, you know, his sort of um, conclusion there is that technology does need to be more involved in politics. And I think that the, the route to solving these major problems around climate change is going to be a collaboration between the technology and the diplomacy and the politics that, that go on. I think it's much easier to put policies in place when people are, are willing to do those things. Phasing out petrol cars in favor of electric cars is much easier when people want to buy an electric car. And whatever you may think about companies like Tesla, I think they've done an amazing job in, in making that desirable. And there's lots of other areas that we can imagine, you know, what's going to be the Tesla for heat pumps that gets people really excited about changing their heating technology. That seems like a major, a major challenge there. So I think that sort of combination of push and pull is going to be very important in, in making these big changes. And I do think that technology, particularly um, the sort of technology that I work in, has a role to play there in engaging the public and, uh, and getting people excited and, and building optimism. I think that's a real area that technology can, can, can take a role in. Um, I think as well, you look at technology like this and it's about virtual world. It's about uh, artificial versions of the real world, but even just because they're artificial doesn't mean they don't have value to a lot of people. I think you can certainly see the trajectory of the last few years is that people's virtual goods are increasing in value, and a lot of the things that people are spending money on now are, are, are virtual. So whether that's outfits in a game, and that's one of the things that we do, to other things that they're buying online that have, that have value. So for some examples I want to talk about briefly today. So, um, there was a very popular TV program called The Mandalorian that came out on Disney+. Plus. The backdrop for that are not f largely physical sets, they're virtual sets. They're, they're built in Unreal Engine, which is our product for building real-time 3D environments. And this allowed them, through virtual production, to film on a set with all the sort of control that you normally get, but can change it very quickly. The director can see the background, the actor can see the backgrounds. You don't have to go to as many sites. And so this is the kind of thing which uh, allows production of, of things like TV shows and films to be done much more rapidly with much less international travel, with other benefits like being able to take those assets and potentially put them into other sorts of experiences for people. We can also look at virtual events with the uh, COVID pandemic, of course, there's a lot of interest in different ways that we can get together, different ways to meet. Maybe there's something better than just Zoom calls. There's lots of companies working with Unreal and other engines trying to build these sorts of 3D uh, interactive experiences. Can I go, can we do better than just a big room full of stands when it comes to explaining some new concept or some new uh, technology? And I think that's a really exciting place that we might go. Um, even things like cars, you know, Obviously, things like uh, racing cars around a track is, is a, an exciting thing to do, but it's been interesting to see the explosion of simulated racing that a lot of people got into over the pandemic. As we start to phase out fossil fuel cars, you can see a, a surge in interest in, in virtual racing. Even Formula One has an eSports uh, event that runs alongside it. And so again, you can see these parallels between the real world and transitioning over to the virtual world where these things have value, have interest, people are really engaged with a much smaller footprint. And I think one area that I've learned a bit about recently that's very interesting is virtual fashion. Fashion is a really important industry, but it can also be a very wasteful industry, and circular economy is massively important there. Vinay just spoke about that, this idea that you can circle things around. And I think there's two areas that this sort of 3D technology can, can play a part. One is in facilitating that uh, circular, circularity of real world objects when you can see what something looks like on you before you buy it, uh, when you can make sure you're buying just the thing you want. These things have a massive impact on uh, the way that that market works. But also entirely digital clothes. There's a number of companies now that are just digital only fashion houses. If you want to wear a different outfit on a Zoom call every day, rather than having to physically buy one, wear one and maybe pass it on, even if you've got something very clever like Materium to do it. But there's now technology available that would let you real time apply clothes to you on a call. And so if you're an influencer, if you're you know, making a statement, if you have an important call to do, you can buy a digital piece of clothing and apply it to you. Again, these things seem very interesting directions that we can go with this sort of technology. And then also the way that these sorts of digital and virtual um, worlds can overlap with the real world. There's this concept of a digital twin, which I you know Vinay has some uh, hesitation about, but I think it is a very interesting uh, direction that we can explore. Um, uh, Buckminster Fuller had this idea of the geoscope, this huge you know, 200 foot dome that was going to project information so that we could all understand the state of the world and make decisions. And at the end of the day, that's what a lot is going on in, in Glasgow right now. And so I do feel like there's an opportunity here for, for engines like Unreal, these sort of 3D game engines, to take all this different information, 
to present it in a way that is accessible to a broad audience and also to allow people to collaborate when they make decisions with the most up-to-date information. There's a really interesting project in Wellington in New Zealand where they've taken all the data around the city from lots of different sources, they've combined it together into a digital twin of the city which is accessible to all of the citizens. So now they can go on there, they can see the state the city's in, they can see potential planning changing the city. And so now they're having an informed conversation. It's much more interesting than trying to go to a planning office or find a PDF online that explains in very technical jargon. Now I can walk around that new station before it gets built. We're informed citizens and with the nature of the way the world is going to have to change in the next 10 years to, to hit these net zero targets, people have to be on board. We have to engage people and get them excited and knowledgeable about what's going to happen. I also think education is another area, sort of following the same idea of engagement. Uh, you know, we've told stories as a way of uh, educating for as long as people have been around, whether it's around health or around religion, lots of different topics. Storytelling is, is just part of who we are. And a lot of stories these days are told on digital platforms, are told as a group together. And so I think empowering people to tell stories and to teach people in that way through these platforms feels like a very natural extension of the way that we've done things for a long time. And I think making those platforms more accessible to lots of different people feels like it will be a very powerful opportunity there. I've been speaking recently to some people at the University of Washington in America. They run a course on green games and also poop games, which is to teach around sanitation in third world countries. They have a class that builds games around these, these concepts. And I was asking them, so you know, why, when you're doing these green games, is it around uh, awareness for these young people? And they said it's not so much awareness for them. For, the, for an older generation, that's, that's part of the idea. But for them, it's about empowerment. It's giving them the, feel, the feeling that this isn't just a foregone conclusion, that they have agency in these situations, and that they can derive their own solutions to these problems. And I think, again, that's a really important um, consideration. Um, also, things like games access a very broad audience of the population. There's a recent report by the OCA charity in the UK, which was talking about games as an opportunity to reach underrepresented parts of the population that other means of medium might not, might not get into. People are maybe spending more time playing something like Fortnite or Minecraft than they are watching the news. And we can also talk about education, not just for people, but for systems. We talked a little bit earlier on about machine learning and how this might uh, allow us to solve some of these problems. We're already be using real-time 3D to train things like self-driving cars or uh, environmental monitoring so that we can get very up-to-date information by using synthetic data to train these models, which allows us to understand the world that we're in all the more efficiently using some of these uh, mechanisms. Uh, I think as we learn more and more and specialisms get narrower and narrower, I think the final thing that I'm really excited about is that these virtual platforms, these digital representations of the real world, allow us to collaborate more efficiently and rather than just having people who are an absolute expert in just one field, maybe we can start to learn a little bit more broadly and have that sort of autodidactic thing that uh, Buckminster Fuller was so keen on where we can all learn a little bit more about other fields and look for opportunities where different fields come together to solve some of these pressing problems because we're running out of time. And so anything we can do, I, I like to think, will be a, a big benefit there. So I'm going to stop there. We've had a lot of really good ideas today. And uh, it's just been very interesting to hear everything that's been said. Um, and I look forward to maybe some more questions later on. So thank you so much. Thank you, James. That was wonderful and informative and uh, engaging. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Uh, and I hope there will be plenty of, of questions uh, for, for everybody uh, later on. Uh, we've got two more speakers, and uh, right now I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Martin Bartos, uh, a Glasgow City Councillor who is a, a very senior and very experienced uh, local politician, uh, to, to talk about what local political action can achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Anton. Um, I, I was planning to just sit so that we can all have a, a relaxed conversation, if that's okay with everybody. Um, uh, what can local politics uh, achieve? Well, um, at this point, there's a real risk that I slip into quite a cynical pathway. Um, but what I think I might want to talk to you a little bit about is kind of um, why we're here. So first of all, thank you very much all for, for coming to Glasgow. I hope the city's uh, treating you well and um, uh, let me welcome you on behalf of the city. Um, we're all here clearly because we're concerned about the way the world is and what faces us in terms of uh, 
trying to fashion some kind of future and trying to get us through this uh, climate emergency, this climate crisis. And I suppose the panel discussion theme is really around these different uh, parallel options of, uh, of politics, technology, diplomacy, how these different things might deliver a better world for us. And as Anton was saying, you know, the, the politics is in the end frequently local or principally local and it's about uh, achieving things. But I have to say with COP and looking back at 20 years of involvement in um, green ecological politics and the traction it has or rather hasn't had, it's not an entirely optimistic setting, frankly. We have to admit that the, the, the phrase which has had most traction in the last uh, week or two has been three words, or rather one word repeated three times, blah, blah, blah. And the reality is that one of the problems in politics at the moment is that there's a lot of talk without much clarity and without much certainty of, of what is going to achieve action. Um, and I suppose that opens up this kind of wider question, which is how do we achieve some kind of successful action on climate emergency? So I, I appreciate we've had some very information rich um, uh, discussions so far. Um, amazing stuff from uh, Professor Martinelli uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the financial constructions which might be able to help shift the world. Uh, amazing stuff from my old friend uh, Vinay Gupta in, in terms of completely re-engineering and rethinking how uh, the life of objects uh, can change and how we can magically change information into things of value. And then from James in terms of the value of information itself and the way that actually experience may well become valuable and may well allow us to shift it in terms of um, what people's lives are like and where people gather value um, experientially into things which are lower carbon because they're virtual. What I'd like to do is maybe suggest to you um, a, a way of thinking about how we engineer or how we solve an emergency. Now, um, as Anton mentioned, I, I'm a, a doctor by professional training as well as being a, a politician for um, some 20 years. And that set me thinking because in, in medicine we're concerned about what actually delivers, what actually gives a result for the patient. Not necessarily always what the patient wants or, or kind of might think they want, so much as what actually helps keep them alive. And that left me wondering, how do you deal with a climate emergency? You know, if you've got a heart attack, there's a, there's a clear list. If you've got a fire, there's a clear list. Quite high up there there's, on the list is call somebody to help you. If we've got a global climate crisis or any global emergency, who are you going to call? So that left me wondering, you know, how do we address any emergency? And, I'll, and, and let me give you something to take away with you, a quick recipe for how you deal with any emergency. And then we can think about whether or not politics or tech or diplomacy are going to work. So here's a quick way of dealing with any emergency you like. It's basically four steps with a fifth wrapper. The first thing, you need to determine that you've got an emergency. Not just spot there's a bad thing happening. You need to make a determination in your mind, there is an emergency. I'm in a building and it's on fire. This is, this is just not bad. This isn't just bad. This is something I need to determine to do something about. So the first step in dealing with any emergency is determination to act, D. Then afterwards, it kind of seems obvious, but you need to have options for meaningful action and inputs into the meaningful action. You need to have things that you can choose to do as well as the resources to do it. And that means plans, clever ideas which might help put out the fire or might help give you breathable atmosphere or might get you somewhere else. Options for meaningful action. But it also requires inputs people, resources, money, skills. You'll need all of these things to get through your emergency, whatever that emergency is. And then the fourth thing you need is you need timely, effective action. 
So if you worked out what you could do, if you found the, the, the means with which to do it, you need to, you need to do it. You need to do it on time, effectively. So those are the kind of four key elements. Determine to act, options for meaningful action, inputs for meaningful action, and timely effective action. And then the, the wrapper which wraps around the whole of that is positive culture. Now, where did I come to this? This, this came from actually what happens in an emergency room or in an A&E department in this country, we call them. You know, there, there's no, there's no uncertainty. The patient comes in, you determine there's an emergency, you have options, very clear options for action. You have inputs, you have the staff, you have the medicines, you have the resources, and you do timely, effective action. That's how you get through it, and everybody is positively, collectively aligned around the interests of the patient. You have positive culture, and that gets you through it, and that gets you good results. So if that's the way in which we fix any emergency, how are we doing with global climate and ecological emergency? Have we got determination to act? It's maybe coming with some people more than others, with some societies more than others, with some companies more than others, with some politicians more than others, with some governments more than others. That's actually the key area where the likes of Extinction Rebellion make a big difference and where activism, it's about trying to persuade the determination to act. But on its own, it won't work. Because you can decide that a patient is sick enough to require resuscitation. If you haven't worked out how to resuscitate them, if you don't have the tools to resuscitate them, if you don't take action soon enough to resuscitate them, it doesn't matter if you go shouting into the A&E department, that patient will die. You need those other elements. So determination, we're maybe getting there. Options for action, this is where I'm worried. Options for measurable, meaningful action. How good are we at knowing what will make a difference? How good are we at knowing what the carbon footprints are of anything in the manufactured system? Oh, governments will give you some statistical analyses. Look deep, they're not reliable. So, options for meaningful action, how well are we doing? And then inputs. You know, how efficiently we are we using the carbon budget, which is finite, before we need to get to net zero? Are we all aware of our carbon budgets? And, and we've heard today already things uh, about things which may help reduce carbon budgets. Going more virtual may well help reduce carbon. You know, let's face it, a virtual F1 racing is going to be a hell of a lot smaller footprint than real F1 racing. But more importantly, circularity in our economy. If we, if we reduce the footprint of what we're making, because we're not making as much, because we're using stuff longer, that's going to have a profound, profound effect. So options, maybe inputs. Are we tracking it? Timely effective action. Are we seeing governments doing that? And positive culture. Are we all on the same page? Like in that emergency room, are we all getting everything done together? Because we realize fixing the planet's problems is vital for all of our futures. Don't know. Don't know, are politicians doing a good enough job? We probably need everybody pulling together. We need the politics to smooth the way. We need the engineering because without the engineering nothing will happen. We need the inputs which is also politics. We need timely effective action. I'm not sure if that is the politics or not. Because I'm not sure if government is capable of doing it quickly enough. But one way or another we need to have some hope because we need to get it done. So we need to collectively get that positive culture and maybe Maybe that's something that we achieve a bit with diplomacy, I don't know. Maybe that's the point at which I stop and leave you with that thought. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bartos. Uh, that was, again, that was uh, extremely motivational and uh, very analytical and very robust. Thank you. Uh, 
Our concluding speaker today, and we are very glad to have her here with us in Glasgow, is Barbara Dietrich. Uh, she is the CEO and editor-in-chief of the hugely respect, respected publication, Diplomatic World. And uh, Barbara uh, knows a lot about diplomacy because she spends a lot of time uh, with very senior world leaders, as well as officials, civil servants, diplomats, and she really understands how those relationships work and I guess how they don't work. So Barbara, please uh, tell us about the role that diplomacy can have in solving the climate crisis. Thank you so much that we are here uh, together. I'm very happy that what yeah, I have here, I'm 100% with you. What we need, we must rethink the diplomacy, we must rethink the uh, political uh, uh, thinking and uh, I think after the time from diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, uh, diplomatic economy, we need climate change uh, diplomacy. That we uh, must changing in the time from the mental health problems and fragility from all the people. We must uh, changing a thinking and the diplomacy. We must looking to the people. We must looking who we can changing. Uh, uh, all and uh, that we must begin working very seriously and uh, what I love to listen that we need hope and we must create hope all is over trust and uh, if I come in here I see so much uh, young people that are in the street and the young people have nothing hope the people ask us so much uh, question and we have nothing answer and i think the diplomacy the climate change uh, diplomacy must explain must help and must be very busy with uh, 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 changing and to inform and uh, uh, make no alone decision on the highest level, but uh, diplomacy, this must be for all the people to make this understandable. And this is very, very important. And we meet here so much people. Uh, we see the people from the Maldives, uh, from Uzbekistan. I was... Uh, I was going to Uzbekistan and I stay uh, on the uh, ground from the Aral Sea and uh, I see uh, what is happened here. For 60 years, Aral Sea was a wonderful sea and in this moment is 10% and I stay on the ground, I stay uh, on the sun and I understand now who can this happen and uh, also people speak over climate change but no what is happened some countries built war, uh, dams some countries built canals and uh, what we make this and uh, what happened in this moment the salt flying with the wind in all the places in the world and Uzbekistan have some problem the people can no uh, plant something all is die and uh, from the salt and uh, we need here actions in the past uh, the people uh, make some program with United Nations and the people plant trees. But in one moment, this stop. But this small tree, uh, this need no water, the water coming from the air, and uh, the stop uh, this, uh, and all the salt stay on the ground, and we must react to this. That we, I think we must call all the world to going to the Aral Sea and plant uh, trees for maybe for two or three weeks. Uh, we need this. We need some actions, and we must help the countries. We need, uh, Valedif need help, Seychelles need help, we must think of the people and uh, the, we have so much plans but what, what doing we really and we must help and we must bring hope, we must understand and, uh, and speak uh, with all the leaders and 
in another way and, and speak of what we need. And we was going to the places and, and understand this. Another is this alone academic, yes, we know this, but going to the place, spend time, be with the people to understand what, what the world needs. This is alone if we are really, really interested. And I think, uh, yes, we need uh, climate change diplomacy. We must rethink diplomacy, we must rethink uh, political, and we must, uh, uh, the soft diplomacy is uh, alone the way to uh, make the changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, we have uh, about 30 minutes uh, for questions, and uh, I think uh, all of the all of the talks that heard, all the presentations that we heard today have thrown up a lot of questions. Uh, so, who would like to start? Please, when you when you when you when you when you when you're speaking, please also say who you are, where you're from. We've got a roving mic over there. Uh, who would like to start? Did, did I see your hand there? No? Really? No, no, no question? Yes. Hi there. My name is Ryan Stoddart. Uh, my question is directed at James. So obviously over the past 18 months there's been a lot of discussion about how much of our life is digital and virtual and concerns around that. So I'm wondering, what are your concerns for life becoming more virtual, particularly for our interpersonal relationships and also for our relationship with nature? I think that's a totally fair question. Um, I do share those concerns. It's something that I think uh, you can only, um, having been cooped up indoors, I think a lot of us during the, the pandemic or you know, staying in one place, I've certainly appreciated, being, I've been very lucky that I can walk to some green space from where I live and that's been hugely important and valuable. Um, I think it's really about finding the places where it makes most sense and using it there. Um, so, you know, this opportunity to maybe collaborate with people without having to fly across the Atlantic for a meeting. That seems like a great opportunity where using a, a virtual approach is, is very important or not having to create 25 clay versions of a car, uh, but be able to use virtual tools to, to develop that more quickly and, and, and more cleanly. That seems a really great opportunity. Um, you're right, I think these, these experiences of purely virtual, completely supplanting um, physical ones. Yeah, I certainly have concerns around that, but I also think you, know, you can see how quickly people came back from the pandemic where things had been more virtual and what, how important physical interactions were. And so I don't think that's going away. I think that's pretty hardwired. I think it'll really be about finding, um, you know, just like we use concrete and steel because one's great under compression, one's under tension, and we've developed architecture to take advantage of those pieces and, and we can sort of reduce the overhead by taking uh, using the things for what they're best at. I think the physical world and the virtual world have their strengths and weaknesses and will build a society that takes advantage of the strengths and weaknesses and overall reduces uh, the costs of because we're using things you know, in the best way. So that's my hope anyway. I'm, I'm optimistic. Thank you. Uh, there was a question there. Yeah, it's directed to Vinay. And basically, I really love the chart when you had Amazon against the Materium uh, concept and doesn't that scare the shit out of Jeff Bezos? And won't he kind of like fight these alternative business models? The only way to fight that business model is to adopt it. You know, and if our role in the economy is that we are, you know, a kind of medium-sized enterprise, 500 employees, and everyone else has to basically copy our approach, otherwise, you know, we eat them alive, we'll do fine and the world will change very, very quickly. Right? I mean, you know, business has kind of enormous catalytical effects by spurring the incumbents into transformation. And those companies are often extremely successful. They wind up with a market cap of a few billion dollars, uh, and then the world changes around them and everybody adopts their innovation. So that's one of the possible outcomes for Materium. Although, frankly, uh, you ought to see what we have coming up after this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beginning of the story. Three or four years from now, the things that we'll be talking about will assume this kind of circularity as a building block, and by then, I will be able to tell you my secret master plan. Right? Because these things are all components, right? Like, the, the housing system that I designed is a component. The critical infrastructure mapping tools that I designed are a component, 
right? The physical asset handling is a component. The governance work that I'm doing is a component. The identity work is a component. And what happens when you put all these things together with the other things that I don't yet talk about is we get the ability to do scalable life support for hundreds of millions of people on practically no money and practically no environmental footprint. So, you know, if we spur a bunch of competitors and a bunch of people copy our ideas, you know, it would be fantastic to see this kind of circularity become standards based and global. But I have no fear for the company because like once we have this running, there is more. Thank you. Please. Hey. Hello, I'm Kiran. I'm from South of India. Uh, my question is towards Vinay. So I want to know, having physical products uh, registered in a blockchain, how, uh, uh, how it do, does it have a legal right of ownership for the person who is owning it? And is it valid in all the countries of the, around the world? Or is it coming up, such a law is coming up? Uh, Anton, that's kind of your department. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, sure. So, uh, a very important component of the Materium system is enforceability of uh, legal ownership and enforceability of uh, the warranties, the information which is provided about the object and recourse if that information is proved wrong. Um, so the system must be enforceable, it must be robust. Um, to that end, uh, the ultimate conclusion of a dispute must be arbitration. So it must have a very strong comp arbitration component. Um, we worked uh, very hard to uh, codify a system which would be effective and uh, one of the great tools afforded to to our, to our community is the new UK jurisdiction task force rules on uh, digital dispute resolution, uh, which uh, essentially enable legally binding, uh, 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 legally binding decisions by arbitrators around disputes and their ability to uh, uh, make awards to the party who's, who, in whose favor they find. Um, Another very important uh, piece of international law is the New York Convention on uh, International Arbitral Awards, which uh, most countries are signatory to, 160 jurisdictions are signatory to that, uh, which makes uh, awards if there is a dispute between a party in, say, uh, France and a party in uh, Mexico. Uh, it means that if both of those countries are both of those countries are signatories to, to that convention. The award is equally uh, recognized. Um, another important thing to note is when you have a system which uh, records information uh, so precisely and so fully, uh, and records uh, the transactional facts, the transactional relationships, uh, that really helps arbitrators because. Much of an arbitrator's job at the moment is determining the facts. Now, the facts are recorded and they are recorded in an immutable way. Uh, then the arbitrator's uh, role becomes more about determining uh, in whose favor they should find rather than spending a long time finding those facts. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, have there anything to add? No, very comprehensive. I mean, the, the, the bedrock for all of this is contract law. So contracts plus very good evidence, it, it provides a tight framework which will be recognized almost anywhere. We put many years of work into making sure that the legals would fit cleanly inside of categories like international arbitration to get this kind of international enforceability. That said, um, you know, it's a, it's a very different situation if you're dealing with, you know, for example, clothing or furniture than if you're dealing with real estate or airline, you know, jet engines or these kind of things. So there is definitely some questions of um, scale, small things, medium things, large things, different ways of handling disputes, but it all roots in contract law. Uh, if I may ask the panel a question, uh, something which Barbara said uh, struck me. Uh, the RLC is a terrible, uh, entirely human-made uh, natural disaster. And I think Barbara said people should see the RLC to understand 
the harm that, that is being done to the environment. Uh, but of course we can't all travel to see the RLC. So uh, Martin also talked about sort of ha being able to make the determination and James talked about education. Uh, I guess my question is uh, how can we enable people to make that determination if we can't all visit the RLC which would be a very heartbreaking site for all of us. Uh, Barbara, would you like to go first? I think we must rethink the media too, that uh, no all the people must travel to, so, to RLC. We can uh, make some projects uh, with game, what is nice, uh, that informs the uh, people, educates the people, trains the people to learn things and open their eyes. I think it's uh, interesting too, and we can act uh, uh, with political uh, parties from all the world to understand this, that we know alone think in uh, small bubbles, that we, we think really worldwide. And uh, if something happened in small uh, village, this has impact in all the world. I think we must uh, change a thinking and we must rethink the role from the media too. And we must stop with fake news and we must bring really uh, correct, informed NIFs uh, that are valuable. And this is, I think, the way to. Thank you. Uh, Vinay, you've spent uh, two decades or more trying to get people to come to the realization that, that we are in trouble. What else can we do? Is it about the best way of delivering and codifying and recording information, or is there more to it? Uh, I think it's a series of funerals. You know, I think what's happening is that the, the politicians and the kind of power holders who were um, not raised with climate change as a reality are gradually aging out. You know, if you think about the kind of oil politics in America, we're on the last handful of oil politics people. We're almost out of classical era cold warriors. Um, you know, the folks whose consciousnesses were shaped by the discovery of the nuclear bomb and then the rapid assembling of massive arsenals and mutually assured destruction. You know, those people had a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder because it was like they were the first generations of humans to be responsible for managing their own apocalypse. You know, th that old line from Oppenheimer, you know, I've become death, the destroyer of worlds. The generation of political leaders that had that as their lived experience were not really able to do anything about climate change. Right? The scientific data wasn't strong enough, but also they'd kind of had their crisis, and if it wasn't the thermonuclear war, they were finding it quite hard to care about. You know? So I think that as those generations age out, what we're getting are people that are in power now have, you know, the climate change has been real for their entire life, you know, at least their entire adult life. The next generation of political leaders, climate change will have been real from the age that they were very small children. And they will find it much easier to act. You know, when Greta Thunberg becomes, you know, the elected prime minister of, I don't know, like say half of Europe, you know, you could very easily imagine that you will get radical climate transformation because the population that elects her for four or five countries simultaneously um, will wind up, you know, having the popular support to push the agenda, which will bring their economies in line with reality. Thank you. Uh, Martin, you talked about determination, and making the determination, and you, you said that uh, we are partially there. Yeah, unfortunately we're also partially not. Um, so the, the, that kind of do it plus framework that I sketched out for you all is, is actually something that you can apply at different scales. You can apply it to an individual, you can apply it to um, a community, a household, a company. Um, a, a state, a region, however you want to do it because, and you can have degrees, you can be, you can be a bit more determined or you can try and get a sense of, you know, how determined is the city, how determined is this room, you know, to act. And I suppose, Anton, your first, uh, the, the starting point of this was uh, Barbara's observation to do with RLC and, you know, determination to act. I guess we don't, we can all get overwhelmed with how big a problem there is and we can lose sight of our ability to have traction on a problem. And one way of addressing that is to reframe what 
part of the problem you're dealing with. So I don't think that we need to determine each of us individually to reform governance structures. Right? That might be a little bit difficult to start with. What we might do, though, is to determine that there is an emergency that I need to act upon, and for me to then think about what are the options for meaningful, measurable action that I can do, and what are the inputs that I can bring to bear, and what constitutes timely, effective action for me, and then as you build the capacity and do more, you think about what you can do collectively with others and how you can help collectively for there to be determination and collectively for options which are meaningful and inputs and so forth. And so I think for me, the RLC isn't a problem that I'm going to focus on. Um, and, and that's okay if I'm helping the possibility that people will focus on it and I'm helping drive forward a determination for people collectively to be going, what the hell are the options which are meaningful for us to do? And that I'm helping drive forwards that people are going to provide those inputs of money, skills, and using the precious resource of our time to get stuff done. And that I'm gonna help drive forwards timely effective action and, 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 and actually be part of a positive culture. So I think that all of us in this room, and both individually and with all of the organizations that we touch on and all the groups that we touch on, can do this. We can, we can improve our determination, improve our options, find the inputs, and take action. And that, that's, that's my suggestion. And you know, my challenge to each and every one of you is, you know, take the do it plus idea, think about it, talk to somebody about it, and work out how do we make that how do we make that happen more? Thank you, Martin. Uh, James, the technology that you talked about, could it show people the horrors of the RLC as it is now? Would people really respond to it in a, in a visceral way? I think that's a, it's a great question and some great answers. Um, I think uh, Roger Ebert said that movies were a machine for generating empathy, and I think that uh, interactive experiences can be that even more so. But I think there's some really important things there. One is we've got to make sure that those tools are accessible to everyone, and that's certainly not the case today. But I, I, I look forward to a future where that is the case, and I think people are figuring out both the hardware and the software aspects of that. So I do hope that that will change. And then we also need to find a way, you know, it's one thing to have those resources available. I'm sure there's videos on YouTube uh, uh, that will document this, but getting people to actually engage with it and, and take notice of it is a huge challenge. Um, I think that thinking about how we decentralize some of these platforms of discovery to discover this content and not make it just the algorithm that is, is choosing what people see. I think that's a really big challenge. I don't have a, a solution to that. I think that's going to be one of the defining challenges of developing these sort of online platforms is, is what parts are centralized and which parts are decentralized. And I think representative voices from all different parts of the world is gonna be uh, a really important aspect to that. So I wish I had more answers, but. Thank, thank you, James. Uh, there was a question from a gentleman at the, at the front there. Uh, the microphone is just coming to you. Um, I have a question for Vinay. I'm from Aspen, Colorado. I represent the Global Warming Mitigation Project. And um, I, I was an intern at the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, God, I was just trying to think the numbers. I believe it was 37 years ago, believe it or not. And that's where I learned about climate change from Amory Lovins and Hunter Lovins. And I couldn't help but notice that the uh, Rocky Mountain Institute was uh, on your resume there of where you've worked. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind speaking briefly about your experience there. Sure. Um, oh, that's a crazy story. So the trouble really starts on the farm. You know, Hunter, Lo uh, not Hunter, what I'm saying here. Um, Stephen Gaskin, Ina Mae Gaskin, Tennessee, big farm. Biggest of the hippie communes in the 1960s. Uh, I think they got started maybe very early, the maybe early 70s. They went out in a couple of hundred school buses from uh, San Francisco trying to find a new place to live because they thought the hate Ashbury was destroying itself. But heroin had arrived. So I was super interested in the 60s when I came to America. I went to the farm as soon as I could got there and a fellow by the name of Albert Bates, who runs a thing called World Watch Institute, completely destroyed my life in a weekend. Uh, question one, 
can you figure out how to make a geodesic dome with no waste? Because we're building the, you know, buckprints for floor designs and they're hard to build. And that set the entire direction of my life in terms of refugee sheltering, refugee management, all the rest of that. And then the second thing, there's this thing called the environment and we're kind of running out of it. And by the time you're grown up, it's all going to be really screwed up. You should do something if you can. Uh, and I kind of sat on that for about five or six years and then 9-11 happened. And it was like a signal flare. It was just like, oh, it's showtime. Um, and through a series of unlikely coincidences involving a Tibetan Lama and uh, a book without an editor and an editor without a book, uh, I wound up on the editorial team for Small was Profitable and then winning the Oil End game. And about midway through that, somebody said, hey, could you figure out how to like, make a refugee shelter that could pack flat? Uh, and I took that question home with me one day and literally said to myself this engineer's question of what's the simplest thing that could possibly work? 15 minutes later, I had the first hexi art drawn out on a piece of paper, made some little cardboard models, and it was like, oh, wow, okay, there goes my future. Because we figured out how to do geodesics with no waste. And you know, we currently have maybe 10,000 of those things being built a year for Burning Man. They're being deployed for homeless people in America. There's a variant called the Shift Pod, which is foldable and goes in the back of a trunk. They've got those things deployed in, I want to say, maybe Jordan. I think they've got quite a large refugee settlement in Jordan. There are a few countries where they're selling them. Uh, the critical infrastructure mapping stuff that I did, uh, RMI had this model, which was the pipes and wires model. The, you know, autonomous buildings, here are the pipes that come in, here are the wires. I spent five years trying to figure out why that model didn't solve my problems and eventually decided that the answer was critical infrastructure is what keeps you alive. And then that became a new model, which was too hot, too cold, hunger, thirst, illness, injury, and a technique called simple cr critical infrastructure maps. Uh, and I just have piles of this stuff, which is built very much on the Rocky Mountain Institute perspective. And that shaped the entire rest of my career. I keep actually trying to repatriate a whole bunch of that uh, knowledge base to Rocky Mountain Institute. Like, hey, you want the refugee sheltering? You want the critical infrastructure mapping? I got the circular economy tooling. Come on, guys, let's do this thing. But it's become so big and so confusing and nobody really remembers the old days. I haven't yet figured out how to have the conversation where I'm like, look, this stuff is directly genealogically descended from this Buckminster Fuller, Amory Lovins, you know, um, um, Bill who went off to do bright green, I can't remember, can't remember, Bill Browning. You know, there's this kind of, you know, education that I got when I was working at the Institute that's resulted in these innovations. And the Institute is way more set up for scaling that innovation than I am. I'm trying to repatriate this stuff over, like, come on, take this and do something with it, guys. So yeah, that was, it was hugely formative. I mean, it, it, RMI is like the finishing school for environmentalists in America. You go there, you work for three years, you burn out, you fall over, and then you go off and do something else. At least that's why it wasn't my day. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 there's nowhere else like it on earth. I mean, it really is like the Ark of the Covenant for the Buckminster Fuller transmission. Thank you, Vinay, that's a fascinating history. Uh, did I see a hand up there? Hi, thank you. I'm Vira McAlpine from MIMA Protocol. Um, thank you for the talk. I'm very glad that I caught your tweet earlier today and uh, decided to come along um, to hear you speak. And it was very interesting to hear about Materium. My question kind of relates to something that James said a little while ago um, about the um, element of recourse and about the dispute re resolution layer in Materium. And I noticed that you explained you were using the traditional legal system. Um, I wondered if you, I, I noticed in the slides that you kind of flashed through, you had a great emphasis on decentralization and on DAOs. And I wondered if you had plans to decentralize the dispute resolution layer as an eventual thing, or if you were going to try and rely on the traditional legal system with all its capriciousness. So um, he, here we've got to be philosophical for a second. Um, the question is, what is property? Right? And our answer to what is property when we're dealing with physical property is property is anything that the state will use violence to return to your ownership. 
Right. And this is a very hardcore definition of property. It comes out, you know, really, you know, fundamental libertarian and anarchist thinking. But if we define property as that which the state will use violence to return to you, that defines who owns what. Right. So our mission with Materium is to find a way of taking the digital reality of the blockchain and representing it to the state in a way that will enable the state to take the status of the blockchain as being an accurate record of who owns what, and then it will use whatever violence is necessary to maintain those property rights. Now, to get there, you need to use a lot of contract law, and you need to use very careful construction of things like the evidence base for arbitration to get rulings, to get solid rules. Um, in that process, if we insert any elements that the state doesn't understand or doesn't trust, we lose the ability to control physical property because the state will simply refuse to enforce and then the system begins to fail. So what we would refer to as the hard path or the unhappy path always uses constructs that the state is fully familiar with and fully recognizes and fully understands. Contract law, evidence, arbitration, digital signatures, all things that have enormous weights of law and uh, prior experience behind them. Um, that system, it's not that it isn't innovative, but it's a bunch of very, very standard components put together in a slightly unusual configuration. None of the actual components themselves are controversial, and the configuration took us several years to design an, an enormous amount of legal work. On the other hand, if we have two parties that are in a dispute, right, I say, hey, you know, you, you told me this clicker worked, and actually it's not compatible with Anton Drigan, we have a problem and I make a claim and then you refuse to pay the claim. At that point, there is a persuasion period that comes before we get to the fully unhappy path with arbitrary urgent state involvement and lawyers coming out of our ears. In that period, that's where the decentralized dispute resolution comes in. So there are uh, tools like, I want to say, Clearos, where you have the potential for saying in the contract, at this point, before you get to the next step of arbitration, you have to mount a case using this decentralized dispute resolution forum. And at the end of that, they will give you an opinion. If you agree with the opinion and settle, all good. If you don't agree with the opinion and you choose to contest, you now have to carry 70% rather than 50% of the resulting legal bills these kind of mechanisms. That isn't exactly the mechanism we have written into the contracts, but that's for example. Right? And that ability to use persuasion at the decentralized level to get people to settle the disputes without going all the way to arbitration is a critical part of the engineering that we're going to be doing over the next few years. To get that to work, we need a base of experience with the disputes. We need enough volume of disputes that we can start sort of saying, well, okay, for these disputes, we tried this and that worked pretty well, but for the really high value disputes, we really need a different thing because it's causing a lot of friction. Maybe we should try this. So th the process of kind of interactively designing those dispute resolution pathways, the hard path is not likely to change very much and we designed the hard path first. The soft paths that route around the hard path and persuade people to settle and persuade people to be reasonable and get people to say, okay, fine, you are right, I did make a mistake, I apologize, I will pay. Those kind of mechanisms, I think a lot of that will be quite decentralized. It's also very important to note that most civil justice systems have a strong preference for dispute resolution before a case comes to them and uh, they don't look favorably on cases where that has not been attempted. Uh, moreover, uh, in certainly in democratic societies where, where uh, citizens have, have recourse to the justice system uh, for, for civil disputes, uh, the courts are choked up with uh, high volume, low level disputes. And uh, again, as, as I mentioned previously, uh, a large amount of the work that the arbitrator, the, 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 the decision maker, uh, magistrate, etc., does, depending on which system you're in, what, what they're called, is fact finding. So if you can combine uh, a very solid recording of undisputed facts and uh, the ability to resolve disputes before they enter that arena, uh, you will get uh, 
justice systems looking much more favorably on, on that kind of proposal. Uh, yes, Thank here at the front, please. Could we have a question somewhere at the back as well? Uh, um, you know you're saying about the property rights. So the example with the clicker, let's say you had loads of different items of property that have contextual value for different people. Can that then be used as like collateral that then someone else gives you like a loan on or something later down the line? Um, yes, in a nutshell, yes. We think there's a lot of, um, a lot of room for pre-selling objects. So if somebody was going to take a building, you could take, uh, for example, the windows and the beams and other reusable components in the building, and you could simply have an agreement with a third party, you know, you will buy this object at this price when we decide we'll, we'll demolish the building. And at that point, you know that you've got, you know, $35,000 worth of reusable components, they've already been sold, they're insured and some other stuff to make sure it doesn't get complicated if something gets damaged, and blah, 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 there are details. But that is an approach, rather than necessarily using lending, because lending collateralized are not, you know, there are a lot of obligations that go with that, it's a messy system. Rather than lending, pre-sale end of life and kind of options like a put option or a call option might get a lot of the same goals of lending, but without the complexity that comes from using objects as collateral. Um, so I think that there's quite a lot of room for um, getting away from the dependence on credit and credit risk estimation um, by using contracts which handle things like sale of goods, you know, in context that solve the liquidity problems that lending solves, but without having interest rate, uh, interest bearing payments on the back of that. I think there's a ton of room for engineering there. Uh, there was a question there. Hello. Thanks for such an engaging panel. It's been really interesting um, to hear everyone's insights. My name's Emily. I'm a PhD researcher looking at climate solutions. I'm also working for a climate startup um, that's seeking to develop a new uh, global system of decision making, and um, I'm a youth delegate at COP. Um, so it's been really um, interesting to hear from some of our panel members who say that they've been working in climate politics for 20 years, um, and also from other panel members who have grown so uh, tired of uh, attempting to um, encourage uh, environmental policy change that they've moved past that to developing um, a different system entirely and I think that was the uh, point I really wanted to touch on was um, in terms of working within our existing um, institutions and our existing systems um, such as COP, such as multilateralism um, and, and um, the effectiveness of that to achieve change or timely effective action um, versus um, putting all of our efforts into developing an alternative system. Um, I was wondering if any of the panel members could, could touch on that point, please. Thank you very much. Uh, shall we start with Martin this time? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, if you don't know what's going to heal the patient, it can be a really difficult decision, you know, what to do and we have a we have a very complicated patient and we have a lot of people wanting to help heal the patient which is a good thing and, um, and the patient has at least two different diseases the the, the the patient has so many different diseases the the patient has hypercapnia which is too much carbon dioxide the patient is developing pyrexia going too hot the patient is experiencing probably multi-organ failure um, the, the parallels, in Mal fact... Malnutrition? Mal yeah, absolutely. The parallels between human illness and what ails the planet are, are disturbing and numerous. But coming back to the kind of fundamental question, which almost feels like, you know, existing institutions or new system, um, what worries me is that I'm not sure we have time for either as an exclusive option. Um, existing systems don't seem to me to be happening, uh, responding very quickly. They get better at dealing with more acute crises, and those are probably coming down the line. So maybe they'll get a bit faster at being a bit more radical when things get worse. That's a, I don't know if that's an optimistic thought or, or not. Um, the alternative, trying to create something completely separate and radical, I think reality is we're all so inter interdependent that you can't make something completely separate. 
I think maybe the, the kind of canny, to use a good Scots word, the canny approach might be to be trying to create the systems which will become useful when they can be used. So my expectation is that governments will start, governments have been getting their heads around the fact that there's a really big problem they haven't been solving. The public are getting their heads around the fact there's a really big problem which governments haven't been solving. We see this represented through XR and, uh, and increasing kind of shouting, louder shouting to determine, you know, we need to determine to act. Where I, where I worry that there isn't enough happening is on all of the work for the options. Because we will need the options whenever people decide that they're determining to act. And we'll need the inputs whenever. So I think if I was suggesting what, what you might do or what people might do is do more on the options, do more on the inputs. Because the determination is building the timeliness and the effectiveness of the action, who knows? But if you're building options, if you're helping work out what's a meaningful, measurable action, if you're increasing the number of inputs with people, with knowledge, with financial resources, then you're giving the patient the best chance. So don't make it an either or, Make it a kind of both, but focus on options and inputs and timely, as well as the determination. But there's a lot of people shouting, right? That's shouting won't be enough, though. That's an excellent answer. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, uh, diplomatic world, uh, of course, documents existing, existing institutions, existing uh, systems. Uh, what, 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 what would you say to the, to, to the, to the questioner? This is a time for changing, and we must uh, have uh, the possibility this to doing, but uh, we need the uh, time to understand this, and all the institu institution needs the time to understand what the changing need, and uh, all the uh, uh, systems speak of uh, reforms, but what is the right reforms? I think we must uh, going. Uh, we have no time, but we need the time, and we must mix uh, the time, yes. Uh, James, uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, technology companies often don't engage with politics, but they often uh, uh, create systems which are alternatives to, what's already, to, what's, to what already exists, until sometimes they get regulated or they don't get regulated, and th those alternatives kind of become, become the new the new normal, I guess, to use a phrase. Um, what, 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 what do you think of that question, and how would you respond? I'm not sure there's a lot I can add of our esteemed uh, panelists here. I mean, I think the only thing I would take away is it's interesting when you see companies pushing, private companies, intelligence companies pushing governments for more stringent regulation. That makes you feel like maybe something is changing at that point and I think that has been very interesting to see that there are you know some of the, as you say these corporations are very large as large as some countries in some cases but they maybe have a longer time horizon than some elected governments do and so I think they're seeing where things are going and saying well if we want to maintain you know continue to be operational and uh, that requires a habitable planet so we really need these changes to, to come about so um, yeah I, I don't think uh, I have much more to add. Thank you James. Vinay. Yeah so I've changed my mind on this several times over the last 10, 15 years, maybe longer, largely by trying things and not having them work. Um, 10 years ago, I thought the hot plan was piling in behind progressive incumbents. You know, my model was that there were basically progressive and regressive forces inside of the institutions, and if the kind of opinionated public piled in behind the progressive incumbents, we could tip the balance of power inside of the existing institutions and get faster action as a result. Uh, and I think there's some room for that. I think it's somewhat successful. Um, now I've come to a kind of different conclusion, which is we just have to stop anybody over the age of 30 voting. <laughs> the, the existing democratic machinery is fine, but we're in a position where because the younger generation is much smaller than the older generation, 
the younger generation have lost control of their futures. Society is reflecting the interests of the people that will be dead before climate change really hits. They're very numerous, they're very wealthy, and they've corrupted democracy for their own benefit. And the problem of democracy is always, democracy is two wolves and a sheep discussing what's for dinner. Right? So the old are destroying the futures of the young as a way of maintaining their enormous pension pots and their five bedroom, three car, three car garage houses. And you know, inside of a constitutional democracy, if you don't have some kind of uh, civil right or, or human rights argument that says a piece of legislation is illegal, you can't do anything about democratic representation. Right? So in America, you have constitutional rights and the constitutional rights limit what the democracy can do, but unless you have a constitutional amendment that says you as a young person have the right to uh, grow up uh, in a world where the climate works and, the nat and nature works in the manner that it did for your ancestors, if we don't have that as a constitutional right, you can't make a constitutional argument that the old don't have the right to destroy the future of the young. So, on one hand, new civil rights, new constitutional rights, extensions to the constitution to manage the rights of the young and protect them as a minority class, right? You know, if the young outnumbered the old by the ratio that they did, say, 100 years ago, you wouldn't have these problems with climate change because the youth vote would be so large and so numerous and so powerful that you would simply not be able to say, we're going to ruin the world in 50 years, don't worry, we'll all be dead. Right? But that, we're going to ruin the world, don't worry, we'll all be dead, is the default negotiating position of all of the political parties because the main, you know, what's the median age of a voter these days? Do you know offhand, Martin? I don't. There are some other things I'd respond to. But oh, sure, sure. Yeah. But the, um, that, that median age of a voter being just way too old creates a situation where what we have is gerontocracy. Society is being run for the benefit of the people that will be dead before the bills are paid for climate change, but also for national debt and the bankrupt pension systems and every other damn thing in this situation. So I think if we were to say the young are a minority and they need minority protections as they would get if they were a member of any other protected class, we can start talking about using constitutional machinery to protect, to protect, protect the future of the young. And I think it's that kind of radicalism, like there is no reason the democratic machinery cannot work, but you have to intervene at a high enough level to address the real problem. And the problem is we are treating young people as if they have no right to a future. And that can be changed, but you have to figure out some way of making a constitutional level argument, a human rights level argument to say, these are the rights of the young. You cannot pass a law to take away those rights. That's unconstitutional or it breaks human rights uh, obligations. And you have to rebuild the structure from the constitutional level down. Now, what will it take to do that? That's an open question, right? Maybe that requires revolution. Maybe that requires, you know, massive, massive grassroots movements. Maybe it requires general strikes. I don't know what kind of pressure you have applied to the governments to get the kind of bipartisan cooperation you need to pass a constitutional amendment in America. But I think that it's a constitutional amendment level work in America and equivalents in the UK, Europe, China. I think you have to go in at that level of human rights to be able to say, okay, the young have this right to a future and the machinery of government does not have the right to act in ways which take their rights away. Thank you very much, Vinay. Uh, we've overrun. We've all run a little bit. Oh, sorry, Martin, did you want to respond? I want to hear what he's got to say. Well, j just very slightly. I mean, I, I think uh, Vinny, who uh, I, I love Vinny's capacity to both um, expand our horizons and also to kind of provoke us to think hard about things. There's a lot in there which I, I completely agree with in terms of uh, the extent to which um, the uh, older political generations have failed um, the future. Uh, the future both for the young but also for the, the future aspirations and hopes of people who are older who care about the future of the young. And actually that's the only little bit which I kind of would, would sort of worry about or disagree with is that fundamentally there's a lot there are a lot of people who've been worrying about this for a long time and doing stuff for a long time. This is not, all, although on average, 
the young are a hell of a lot better educated about the significance of the problem, actually there are problematic actors at all ages who don't understand. Um, in the end, humans are messy and are motivated by the same kinds of messy things that make them unreliable for, for, for taking action. So it's not quite as simple a fix, but yeah, it's a really, really big mess. And I think, you know, the notion of just amputation as a cure for this particular medical problem. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, the, we already say there are people who are too young to vote. You, you could oh. very easily say there are people who are too old to vote. It's a very small tweak for a lot of radical change. Sure, sure. But be careful if you amputate, um, that you're amputating the limb and not the head. Well, you know, it, we'll see how it goes. But th this is an example of the kind of, you know, opening up of political horizons. When it struck me that, you know, we say that people who are, you know, under, say, 18 are too irresponsible to be allowed to vote, you know, what is the argument that if people who are over, let's say, 70 are on average voting for total destruction of the future, that they are not also too irresponsible to be able to vote? Like, once you frame that question and say, you know, what are the requirements for franchise, maybe the answer is not to remove the vote from anybody over 30. Maybe the answer is to drop the age of democratic franchise to five. Right? There's, a, there's a much wider problem though with democracy, which is that democracy is not defined, um, or the outcomes of democracy are not necessarily defined on polling day. Yeah. Because yeah, actually yeah, yeah. on polling day you are simply getting to pick between the plates which are put in front of you. You're not actually in the kitchen defining um, what the, the recipes are and the dishes which are being taken out amongst which you have to choose. And actually democracy, this is a really long other evening conversation <laughs> folks, Indeed. Um, the, the problems with democracy. Um, yeah, maybe that's for an well, after session uh, conversation. I, I, indeed, uh, and, and uh, I'm being reminded that we've already overrun uh, the, the time slot. So uh, uh, please, please come and speak to the panelists uh, after this event. Uh, tomorrow there is going to be one more uh, materia, uh, event convened by Materium here at five o'clock entitled Green Blockchain, Green Democracy, and we'll hear from uh, Avalanche, uh, we'll hear from uh, a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute uh, uh, and others, it'll be fascinating. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Barbara, Vinay, Martin and James. Uh, thank you very much to Hub Culture for hosting this wonderful space. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Materium team, uh, Katie, Jeremy and Andrew for helping run this so wonderfully and so smoothly. Thank you so much and we hope to see some of you tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Thank you, Anton.